So the great news about bilirubin metabolism is that you know so much about it and that it's essentially just a breakdown product of normal or abnormal red cell destruction, breakdown, senescence, you name it. So let's just refresh ourselves on how bilirubin gets um, from the red cell into actually being bilirubin. All right, so here's a red, here's a blood vessel, right? So here's our, this is just a vessel. Those are obviously red blood cells in our vessel. And so normal, around 1% in dogs and a little bit less in cats, red cells are destroyed and produce every day, right? So just normal senescence. And how that happens is that the cells essentially just get identified through a, ver a variety of receptors, uh, and then they are phagocytized by splenic macrophages, right? So we know that. So that's a macrophage in the spleen. And then what happens is that, remember that we have hemoglobin, and we get broken down into heme and globin. And of course, globin's recycled into the blood. And then heme is further broken down into iron, which again is recycled, we know that. But then what we have is our waste product, and that's bilirubin. And so bilirubin is a waste product, and it has to be dealt with. And so bilirubin gets bound to a carrier molecule, and that carrier molecule is albumin, because this is called unconjugated bilirubin. Or when we measure it, it's considered indirect bilirubin because we indirectly measure it. But uh, we don't, a lot of places don't necessarily divide out the types of bilirubin. But this is unconjugated and it's not water soluble. So it has to be taken via the blood and to get into the liver. And so sitting outside the liver is unconjugated, and this is bili. Again, also known as indirect bili or iBili. And it has to get into the liver. So this is kind of step one, is actually getting into the liver. So getting into the liver is this, the first step, and we'll talk about how that can be impacted. And then once it's in the liver, it has to be conjugated. And so that's the next step. And so we'll make that green. And so conjugation happens. And the liver does this with lots of substances. By conjugating it, it makes water soluble so it can be excreted. And so now you have conjugated bile, which is also known as direct bilirubin. In some of the cases, you'll see that I separate out direct versus indirect, and this means it's directly measured, but it's conjugated. How do you remember which one's which? Well, in, un, and then there's kind of no prefix on direct and conjugated. So step two in this is it has to actually get excreted out of the liver. And I'm going to put this in this color. And getting excreted out of the liver, of course, involves the bile canaliculi. And so remember in your hepat here's your hepatocytes. They're terrible hepatocytes. And your bile canaliculi are the bile, kind of the pathway for bile between hepatocytes. And then that eventually goes via um, a bile duct at that portal triad, right? So we have our portal triad with our portal vein, our hepatic artery. Uh, and the bile duct. And so the bilirubin via the bile leaves the bile duct. It eventually goes into bile ductules, then gets into the common bile duct, and eventually goes into the intestine. That's a terrible intestine. Let's try that again. Into the intestine for excretion. Now, one thing I haven't mentioned yet is that actually getting out of the hepatocyte is something that's a little bit harder to do. So that's step two, and that's what we consider our rate-limiting step. So getting conjugated is not too bad of an, a problem, maybe if the liver's not working as well it is, but actually getting out of the hepatocyte, so you have to, you're in your hepatocyte and getting out, that's the part that can get overwhelmed easily, more so um, than any other part. And so when we talk about um, pathologic hemolysis and pathologic production of bilirubin, we're going to talk about how that can get overwhelmed. So now we have bilirubin in our intestine, 
and it's the conjugated bilirubin, and it eventually becomes something called urobilinogen, which I'm not going to test you on. Urobilinogen, and essentially then eventually um, that goes into your feces as stercobilinogen, and that's what makes your poop brown. Some urobilinogens actually reabsorbed by, I'm going to make that your portal vein, some of that's actually reabsorbed and it goes to your liver and is taken up via the blood to the kidney and that's why you'll then see some urobilinogen in your urine. And we can use it as a test of sometimes as a test of patency of our bile duct, but we don't necessarily talk about that a lot and we're not going to talk about that. A couple things um, to realize in all of this is that any of these steps can actually get overwhelmed um, and any of these can then cause an increase in bilirubin. When we talk about actual abnormal hemolysis, or excuse me, ab abnormally high bilirubin, that's what we'll talk about.